The official Big 12 Watch countdown is on. All four new member schools will be entering the conference on July 1st, 2023. We learned that over the weekend. What else did we learn over the weekend? Well, we have two new national champions that call Provo home on the women's track side of things, a new visit set for BYU men's basketball, and a new commitment for the BYU football program. All that and more ahead on today's edition of Locked on Cougars. You are Locked on Cougars, your daily podcast on the BYU Cougars. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, everybody? I'm Jake Hatch, your host here on Locked On Cougars, your resident BYU insider. I work for the Zone Sports Network in Salt Lake City, Utah, as the executive producer of DJ and PK in the morning. And a big thank you once again for making us your first listen here on Locked On Cougars. Very proud to be part of the Locked On Podcast Network, where, of course, the motto is your team every day. And as such, this is your only daily podcast focused on the BYU Cougars. Huge thank you for you guys' support. But our goal here every single day is to make you guys the smartest BYU fans in the room. Uh, I'm calling this another post-church edition of the podcast. I decided to ditch the tie, but I just got home from Sunday meetings just a little bit ago. I decided to sit down and knock this podcast out. So I don't usually wear a colored shirt, but, you know, just deal with it for today. But let's get going. Talk some BYU football here. Officially learned that the Big 12 watch, the official countdown has begun. BYU will be joined by the other three new members of the Big 12 conference, speaking of UCF, Cincinnati, and the University of Houston, in joining the Big 12 conference on July 1st, 2023. The other three schools are members of the American Athletic Conference. We got an announcement over the weekend saying that all three of those schools have finally uh, gotten the deal done to exit the AAC early. They will pay a grand total of $18 million spread over essentially a decade or so that they'll pay out from 2025 through 2036 as part of their exit agreement. Uh, there were $10 million that was automatically to be paid by leaving the conference and then the negotiated settlement on the rest of this stuff for the early exit because the American Athletic Conference had a uh, – what do you call it? A deal in place. We had to give them 27 months notice. That would have put uh, these schools out into 2024 at the very earliest to join the conference in that circumstance. But they negotiated a new deal and they will pay a grand total of $18 million to exit. And BYU's grand total of $500,000 as compared to $18 million looks like a swing in deal. BYU is paying the $500,000 to the West Coast Conference as part of their bylaws to exit that conference and join the Big 12. I think this is really, really good news because you didn't want to have BYU go into the conference in 2023 and have a 13-team conference for one year. Or excuse me, uh, that would make it a, an 11-team conference for one year. And then the next year, have the other three potentially uh, join the conference with Texas and Oklahoma exiting. It would have caused all kinds of chaos. Getting all four member schools to enter on the same date, so we're just over a year away from that, 380, let's see, today we, recording the po today's podcast, 384 days, I believe. Uh, from today, those two schools, uh, those four schools will enter the conference. And obviously, that is going to be big news. I cannot wait for this. I am very excited for the Big 12 future. The bigger thing is, when does Texas and Oklahoma exit the conference? All the reports out there, Brian Davis, one of the guys that I think is very much tuned into all of this. He is the uh, Austin at the Austin American Statesman down there in Austin, Texas, covering Texas athletics. He said that talked to a source that said that it was 2024 is the very earliest that Texas and Oklahoma would be exiting that conference. So you're going to have at least one season, it appears, for all intents and purposes, of BYU joining the Big 12 and the Big 12 being a 14-team conference before ultimately Texas and Oklahoma depart. I am of the opinion that it could last until 2025. Uh, neither of these schools want to pay the 80-some-odd million dollars out there. There have been no reports on any negotiations with regards to getting these two schools to pay a lesser sum to exit. Early. I don't think the Big 12 has, has any interest in letting them leave early. I think they want to keep them in the conference and compete with them as long as they possibly can. And it's good for the TV revenue. Let's be real. Texas and Oklahoma, their draws on TV. There's no doubt about that. So 
Get ready for a, a big 14, if you want to call it that. The Big 12 having a 14-team uh, schedule, a 14-team conference, I should say, going into the 2023 and 2024 seasons before ultimately settling to its true Big 12 moniker in 2025. I am super excited to see BYU join this conference. There's a lot of people out there who are going to tell you, well, once Texas and Oklahoma depart, it's not going to be a Power 5 conference anymore. You know what? You can say that all you want. The fun part is, is having the two heavyweights, if you want to call them that, because Texas, what have they done to punch above their weight, or punch down uh, since being what? Mac Brown's best team was back in 2008, maybe? Like they have, Texas hasn't been anything relatively in the football sense in quite some time. So I am actually not all that uh, concerned about Texas leaving as I am about Oklahoma. Oklahoma has been very, very good for many, many years. They are probably going to be the odds on favorite during the time that BYU is a member of this conference. We'll see if Sark can get Texas going a little bit here, but once those two depart, it's actually going to open up all kinds of opportunities for schools, all of the schools, the new other 12 schools that'll be in the big 12 to say, okay, the big fish have left. Let's see who's going to become that big fish in the pond. And that's the fun part about this is BYU. You go on on an almost equal footing in many ways going into the Big 12. And the other part about this is, is the money you'll be making will obviously uh, help you continue to compete. You have to obviously invest that well, use it to great effect. But BYU's always been smart with their money. That's one thing, the BYU Athletic Department, they're actually kind of one of the pioneers, I feel like, in many ways, in terms of operating in the black, even with uh, having to take less or do less, do more with less. And I've used that as a derisive term at times when talking about BYU athletics. But the one thing I'll give them credit on, BYU is one of those athletic departments. There are less than, I think, 20 or so of them. Maybe it's maybe as many as 30 but it's compared to 131 FBS institutions. If there are upwards of 30 that operate in the black, even uh, right now uh, during all these pandemic uh, times that we have been in, you'd be surprised how many of these athletic departments run at a negative. They, they, they run at a deficit. They have their schools bailing them out, for lack of a better term, with regards to their athletic department. BYU is not that way. Tom Homo has been entrusted with the money that he makes he's able to spend. And the nice part is there's going to be more money than BYU has ever had in their history as an athletic department, especially as a football program coming in beginning in 2023. It'll be a half share for BYU in the first two years in the conference. And then it'll be a full fledged member in 2025 when the new media rights deal for the big 12 goes into effect. This is going to be a big, big jump for BYU in so many different ways. The nice part is though, you are in the big time. BYU jumped to independence way back when, when Utah made that jump to the Pac-12 and TCU was in the process of jumping to the Big 12 themselves because BYU wanted to be a part of the Power Five. Some of you out there feel like BYU in some ways is quote unquote selling out. No, they've always just wanted to compete at the highest level they can possibly compete at. And the nice part is they have finally achieved that. They took a gamble on themselves, going independent, spending a decade putting these schedules together, having their TV rights with ESPN, all that stuff. They took a massive gamble betting on the fact that if they were able to go out and bide their time, they would get that long-awaited call up to the big leagues. And now it's just over a year away, folks. It is a very exciting time. And the nice part is BYU – the Big 12 is not going to go in there and have BYU automatically push to the bottom of the conference. I feel like they can go in and compete on a fairly equal footing, especially in football, if Kalani Satake continues to do what he has been doing. This is a program, think about it, has won 21 games in the past two years. I am of the opinion that 10 games, 10 plus wins this season is not out of the question. If you've won 30 plus games going into the Big 12, what, who's to say that you're not going to go in there and compete right away? Uh, there are people out there who will tell you, okay, well, you're going to play power five opposition each and every week. You only played seven power five opponents last year, folks. They held up just fine. Uh, I know that down the stretch, it didn't look great and it didn't. The defense struggled, but they went five and over versus the Pac-12. This is a program that can compete at the power five level. It has proven itself. And man, am I excited to see them enter that conference in just over a year's time. All right, coming up here in just a moment, we'll continue on some other BYU football notes as well as a basketball note in terms of some recruiting news, a transfer opportunity for BYU basketball potentially with a visit upcoming according to Vanquish the Foe and a new BYU football commit. We'll get to all of that here in just a moment. First, though, a word on our friends over at Bet Online. They are 
your number one source for all of your betting stats and sports information needs. Find all the latest sports developments, news and odds, including this year's basketball championship matchup in the NBA, the NHL's uh, Stanley Cup final, which is going to begin this week. Finally, Major League Baseball scores. And of course, the latest fight news from MMA to UFC and boxing. BetOnline is your continued source for all of your sports wagering information, including live betting, esports, and more. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends in action available to you now. It's all courtesy of your friends at Bet Online where the game starts. Thank you once again for making Locked On Cougars your first listen of the day. The Ultimate NBA Mock Draft begins June 16th, my friends. With over 50 insiders, nothing equals the Ultimate NBA Mock Draft. The Locked On and NBA Big Board Draft Experts plus the Odyssey Insiders will be covering it from top to bottom, my friends. The first pick is June 16th. Search out the Ultimate NBA Mock Draft and follow now on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts so you do not miss a pick. And that's a big opportunity. If you are an NBA Draft fan or just an NBA fan in general, you want to kind of get inside in tell on where your team might be picking check out that show they do a great job the production value is absolutely incredible so make sure you guys take an opportunity and check that out all right a couple of things on the recruiting front here from the weekend that was byu got a new running back commit enoch nawahine is committed to play for byu kind of a long traveled a player despite being very very young in his career uh he announced his commitment saying turning dreams into reality on twitter hashtag committed hashtag go cougs with pictures of him in a byu uniform he originally signed with Utah State in 2019, played with the Aggies this past season and in a reserve role, did not see many stats. He had two receptions and a couple of carries during his time with Utah State. Originally actually was a Boise State commit, but he is a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Uh, spent two years serving a mission in, in the Zambia, Lusaka, South Africa mission. So he went uh, clear across the world. Any of you who have ever been to Africa or especially South Africa know how far away it is. I had a couple of friends, uh, missions in South Africa and hearing about their travel. And I traveled to uh, Taiwan on my mission. That was a pretty lengthy travel. But getting to South Africa, man, talk about an absolute hike, uh, to use a relative term there. It's actually kind of funny. They had to fly, I think, I'm, I'm getting way off the way off in the weeds here, but I think you had to fly to Atlanta or New York, New York to London. And I think London to uh, Cape town or Pretoria. I don't remember exactly the, the exact scenario, but a lot of travel. So really cool to see now Hine uh, signing with BYU. He is from Hawaii, played at Kahuku high school. He's a red Raider for any of you out there, uh, up there on the North shore in Laie, Hawaii. As I said, uh, he is a guy who played in 10 games for Utah state this past year. Oh, he actually carried it more than I thought 16 carries for 53 yards. Also had two special teams tackles and two receptions for seven yards in his career. Uh, during his career in high school had 985 yards in a senior season and 11 touchdowns. He is listed at six foot one, 195 pounds and will have three years of eligibility remaining plus a red shirt year. So this is a big opportunity for BYU think, to bolster the running back room. I don't think that Nawahine is coming in right away and going to be a uh, guy that's going to challenge for starting time. I think there are at least probably four guys, in my opinion, that are in front of him on the depth chart. I think Christopher Brooks is the odds on favor to be BYU starting running back this year. And then you can have any number of a trio of Lopini Katoa, Jackson McChesney, and Miles Davis behind him competing for playing time. Now, Wahine at the bare minimum, and I'm expecting he comes in as a walk-on to the program, will provide depth. He's got good size to him. And as I said, he's a guy from Kahuku. So anybody that I, I've ever known that played for the Kahuku Red Raiders, the one thing that always stands out to me about Kahuku Red Raiders is the fact that they are just football players. They know how to play the sport the right way. And I think Nawahine, he comes in and just provides that depth that BYU is always looking for at their position groups. And he's a guy, obviously, who's very familiar with BYU, having served a mission, all that stuff. This is, a, I think, a big opportunity for him. As I said, he's a former B, a Boise State commit, then signed with Utah State, served a mission. He is well-traveled, despite uh, only being a sophomore officially on the roster. But congratulations to Enoch Nawahine, and congratulations on coming to BYU for him. Now, on the basketball front, BYU obviously is still trying to fill out that roster. The way I understand it and the way I've kind of done my math, they have still got two scholarships to fill. Uh, they are still looking for a big man, and that is where we're going to stop today. And that comes from Robbie McCombs of vanquish the foe saying that transfer forward noah waterman is set to visit byu what you need about noah waterman is he is tall six foot 11 uh coming to byu for an official visit uh becoming this uh week sometime in the middle of the week according to robbie mccombs 
What Waterman uh, is interesting about him is he's listed as a guard slash forward despite stand, standing six foot 11. He is a swing man. He can shoot the four, probably would play kind of a stretch four, maybe even a big, big three if BYU needed him to. Uh, he had originally committed to St. Bonaventure the first week of June, but then backed off of that commitment. He's going to be coming to BYU. He's been in college for three seasons, originally playing at Niagara, but then uh, ended up spending time at Detroit Mercy. And any of you remember what Detroit Mercy, uh, they made the headlines just recently uh his teammate uh i'm trying to think of his name i it went blank on, in my mind oh my gosh uh who was it? it was the it was the guard i'm trying to think of his name uh man i anyways you know just one of those things that you you think you have everything in your mind and ready to go on your notes and then you fail to note one but the biggest thing is what he did at Detroit Mercy, speaking of Waterman, is he can shoot the three at a very high level despite standing six foot 11. Uh, he uh, slowed down this past season, only shooting 38% from deep. Before that, he shot 44% from three and at six foot 11, you cannot teach that size. And I think this would be actually a very, very good pickup for BYU if they were able to get him into the fold. I, I obviously you've got to go out there and earn his commitment, but this kind of screams to me the perfect addition to BYU's roster. If everything translates, translates uh, directly across. Rarely does it actually do that in the basketball world because different systems favor different guys' skill sets. But I like Noah Waterman standing six foot 11. If he can play on the wing, playing it anywhere, if he's listed as a guard slash forward, that means he could play maybe a two guard in a huge lineup. But the biggest thing I think BYU is probably looking at him as is you're going to be that four man. You're going to allow us to spread the floor, allow a guy like Fus uh, Triori to work on the interior while you camp out on the three point line and drain threes for us. Obviously at six foot 11, he's got plenty of size. If he has a small or guy guarding him he can go down into the post and score that way as well you would hope at some point but i think the biggest thing is is waterman screams to me almost like the perfect fit for byu the biggest thing i i've been trying to stress during this entire process for byu basketball to any of you who have been listening or watching this show is that uh, i I'm I'm of the opinion you need to give Mark Pope uh, the trust and the the belief that he can go out there and fill out the roster he thinks he the way he needs to he feels like he needs to fill it. That is the one thing I have that has stood out to me about Mark Pope is we have been very quick to say well the wheels are coming off and blah blah blah. We've been very quick to kind of just bury Mark Pope, especially this off season. I think if you get a guy like Noah Waterman to commit, he could average 12 points and four and a half boards uh, during the COVID shortened 2020, 2021 season. That's the fun part about this. This is a guy who can still rebound at six foot 11. Maybe he could probably rebound a little bit better, but he brings size that you do not find every day. So that's the fun part about this. It was Antoine Davis. That that's who it was. I, that, the Detroit mercy guard. Duh. You know what? You know what comes to your mind when you're thinking about stuff? It doesn't come right when you need it, but give them three or four minutes and all of a sudden it'll come right back to you. But the biggest thing is I like what Noah Waterman potentially offers to the BYU roster. He brings that stretch four element in, in every sense of the word. The ability to go out to the three-point line and stroke it from deep. I have said that BYU needs some three and D guys. A stretch four would be awesome. This is the stretch four variety. If everything goes according to what I am hearing about Kim Aiken, if he can get accepted into grad school, he is the transfer from Arizona who is more of the true three and D wing six foot seven, 200 and some odd pounds, a really good defensive player who also can shoot some from three. If you can get Kim Aiken and Noah Waterman onto this roster, I think suddenly BYU is feeling really good about themselves roster wise going into the season. Obviously you have to get all these parts together. You got to get them in on the campus and start to see how they mesh and how they work together. But it looks like right now BYU is doing a good job. Mark Pope's doing a good job compiling this roster. Has it taken longer than most of us probably would have liked? Absolutely. We're now into June, and obviously school starts in August, and then the season, we're under 150 days to the basketball season. Yeah, you would have liked to see BYU set this lineup a little sooner, and it may uh, play out a little bit longer if Noah Waterman decides to take other visits. But I think the biggest thing right now is that maybe we were just a little bit – just just the smallest bit hasty in terms of saying, well, the wheels are coming off the BYU basketball program. I actually think that they're, they're right where they want to be. So we'll see how it all uh, pans out for BYU basketball, but some good news on the recruiting front, it appears because an official visit uh, means that Noah Waterman really does have some interest in BYU. And like I said, Standing 6'11", the ability to shoot 40% from three, the ability to play potentially, what, the two through the five for BYU in any given lineup, that versatility. Mark Pope has made it a hallmark of his time at BYU as having positional versatility with his roster. 
Noah Waterman screams exactly that. He's like the prototype, I think, in many ways of what Mark Pro- prob- Mark Pope probably wants for his roster. And if you get like a guy like Kim Aiken, also if he can get enrolled in grad school, I think suddenly that roster for BYU looks a whole lot better than it did just a couple of months ago when it seemed like everybody was leaving the program and the sky was falling. So uh, some good news on both fronts there for BYU. Some very good news for the BYU women's track and field program because we got two new national champions calling Provo home. We'll round out today's show with those notes coming up here in just a moment. Uh, First, though, a reminder for you guys that today's show, our title sponsor, as we already mentioned, is our friends over at BetOnline. Get to BetOnline.net. Learn everything you guys need to know about with all of their – with all, excuse me, with all of their uh, options available to you guys, I just had a funny message pop up on my computer here as I was recording this. But uh, check it out. It's betonline.net, of course, big sponsors and the title sponsor of today's podcast. All right, before we go here on today's show, let's talk a little bit about what's going on with BYU Women's Track and Field. And let's start off with Ashton Reiner. Uh, She won the Javelin National title, the first ever for BYU, uh, winning the Javelin title at Hayward Field up there in Eugene, Oregon this past weekend. Absolutely incredible throw. She actually launched a 191-foot, one-inch opening mark. No other thrower matched that mark. So her first throw won her the title. She ended up having to make another throw uh, later on that. She will win the event by just under two feet, earning the Cougars' first women's field title since Anna Mosdell's discus title way back in 1992. It's been 30 years since BYU won a field title in the track and field national championships. Uh, Ashton is obviously a phenomenal athlete. She had the best throw in the country earlier this season at the Robison uh, track complex at one of the home meets for BYU, and then she goes and backs that up with a national title. Absolutely incredible for her, and congratulations to Ashton Reiner. Uh, her husband, by the way, is BYU tight end Lane Lunt. Uh, Lane's got some living up to do because that's pretty impressive. When your wife can be like, hey, I have a national title under my, my belt. What do you got? That's it's pretty tough to top that. So uh, congratulations to Ashton Reiner. Uh, she was only outdid by Courtney Wayman. She capped off her BYU career by winning the 3,000-meter steeplechase as the number 14 BYU women's track and field team finished ninth overall at the NCAA Division I Outdoor Track and Field Championships. Uh, Saturday night, Kate, uh, Wayman per- uh, timed a personal best of 9 minutes, 16 seconds flat, breaking her own school record, the collegiate record, and the meet record while also running the fifth fastest time in u.s history she broke the record folks by nine seconds just that's an eternity in the track and field world absolutely incredible work by courtney wayman she just ran the race of her life essentially she has won three national titles in her career now Uh, like i said going out on top congratulations to byu they finished tied with colorado for ninth overall with 21 overall points it's the second straight year that byu has recorded a top 10 finish by the way um, we do need to give a shout out to nick arrhenius the throws coach for ashton reiner coaching her up in the track and field side of things on the throws side uh nick obviously is a former discus holder, a men's championship holder for BYU. He coaches the throws team for BYU on the men's and women's side of things. And then Diljeet Taylor, we all know about her. Uh, She's done some incredible work with BYU women's cross country. Well, she's doing her magic on the track side of things. Uh, Courtney Wayman, if you saw the video of that, she went over to celebrate with Diljeet Taylor. And Diljeet Taylor is just a phenomenal phenomenal coach. Ed Eyestone made a home run hire when he he brought her in. She is now the women's cross country head coach. And I believe she has another title. I, I have to look it up again one more time. Uh, to find out exactly what it was. Oh, here we go. BYU Associate Director of Track and Field, Diljeet Taylor. There you go. The Associate Director of Track and Field, uh, Diljeet Taylor. Incredible work with BYU on that front. And on the men's side of things, they had a good weekend as well. The number fourth ranked uh, Cougars, though, did not have the finish they were hoping for. They tied for 39th overall with three first-team All-Americans as the meet concluded at Hayward Field on Friday night. Kenneth Rooks uh, recorded a second steeplechase, personal best in three days. He clocked an eight-minute, 22.5-second final to finish sixth in that championship. Uh, He shaved seven seconds off his personal best, uh, moving up to number two all-time at BYU. So congratulations to him. Uh, By the way, he's just a year removed from full-time mission service for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. So you think that he's probably only going to get better as time goes on. Colton Yardley, the senior hurdler for BYU, uh, finished with a first-team citation 
clocking a 50.10 second 400 meter finals hurdle, uh, passing Jaden Smith of Texas A&M and New Mexico's Rivaldo Leacock for a seventh place finish to get that first team citation. Congratulations to him on that front. And then Casey Klinger finished in 10th place in the 5,000 meters, uh, getting second team All-American honors. So not necessarily the way BYU men's track envisioned this being ranked number four going into the championships, having to settle for a 39th place finish, but a good weekend all the way around. And like I said, those two national titles on the women's side of things, you can't beat that. So congratulations once again are in order to Courtney Wayman as well as Ashton Reiner. And then finally, one other note, I forgot to note this last week, is that BYU claimed the 2021-2022 WCC Commissioner's Cup, and then the women's team won the All Sports Award. So congratulations uh, to BYU Athletics overall. It's really cool to see them win these awards. They've won, I think, nine of them. Let's see, ninth consecutive Commissioner Cup victory for BYU in their 10th year of being in the conference. It's a pretty impressive run for BYU. It's based on a point system reflecting the finish of each team in conference play. Obviously, the women's team uh, won the all sports on the women's side of things. And then also the Mike Gilleran Scholar Athlete of the Year uh, went out as well to BYU. I believe, um, who won that? I'm, I'm, man, I should look this up real quick. I'm pulling this up as we go along here. The me, uh, Mike Gilleran WCC Male Scholar Athlete of the Year, Connor Mance. That was it. One duck. Connor has gone pro now, but obviously was a phenomenal runner, winning two individual national championships in men's cross country. So congratulations to the Women's All Sports Award for BYU, the Commissioner's Cup, and then obviously Connor Mance in the individual things, the Male Scholar Athlete of the Year. Very well-deserved honors all the way around. All right, so there you go. You're up to speed on everything that happened over the weekend in BYU sports. Uh, we covered a lot there, but a huge thank you for your guys' support of the podcast. As always, thank you for making us your first listen of the day. If you have not done so already, uh, right here down in this lower right corner, if you've made it this far in the podcast, hit that subscribe button. It subscribes you to the show on YouTube if you're watching this on video. Make sure you guys like the show, comment on it, uh, enable notifications by hitting that little bell button. That way, when a new episode drops, it drops and you guys can watch it immediately if you so desire but a big thank you overall for your support of the podcast as always coming up later this week on the show we're going to talk a little bit about utah state with an early look at the aggies we'll obviously continue to talk about byu football overall we're just over a week away from byu uh, football media day. the final media day in the month of june folks uh next year this time they'll be getting ready for big 12 media days in july so think about that it's so close the big 12 is going back to our original uh starting point on today's show it's crazy to think about some how some things are going to end. These early media days, yeah, those are going away. This is the last go-round of that. That is a week from Wednesday, crazily enough. But get ready for it. We'll have you covered in the lead up to that. And obviously, we'll have you covered on every other front when it comes to BYU sports. You guys know how we do here on the podcast. So until then, have a great rest of your day. Thank you for making us your first listen of the day. Now go make our friends over the Locked On Big 12 podcast your second listen. Get up to speed on everything going on in the Big 12 conference with Josh Neighbors in 30 minutes or less. That is free and available wherever you get your podcasts, just like this one. Until tomorrow, have a good one. This has been the Locked On Cougars podcast for June 13th, 2022, and we will talk to you guys manana.